Well, good after good afternoon, everybody. Let's try to get things started here at Homestead. I want to welcome you to the service today. Wow, we got a little bit of moisture in the air and humidity, and a little bit of rain. It smells good and settled the dust. So, a lot to be thankful for as we gather together to worship the Lord today. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, Ladies' Bible studies are going to be kicking in this next week or two, and uh, Bonnie's has got a Bible study that's starting Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning, and then also one on Thursday night. And so, uh, if ladies, you'd like to be a part of that, she's got a great book they're going to go through and study together. Uh, contact Bonnie and let her get your name on the list if we haven't got your name already. So, same with Heidi, and Heidi, I think, is meeting probably the following week, and so... Uh, Talk to Heidi if you'd like to be a part of that one. That is an evening on Wednesday nights, I believe, is when that one meets. So, uh, Brock, you have an announcement about uh, uh, something coming up, so why don't you hit that one real quick? Yeah, if uh, Rodeo Bible Camp um, is looking for some help and some fresh blood on the board, um, just if you have any interest in that camp helping next year. So they got a year-end meeting coming this Tuesday, two days from now, the 20th, 6.30 at the local Harvest restaurant. So 6.30 Tuesday, the local Harvest. If you want to find out more or maybe do a little more with camp, Rodeo Bible Camp. So they could use some help. So, uh, Bill Hansen has an announcement. Bill and uh, Linda's not here. She's babysitting. Where's Bill? Oh, right, over right over here. Why don't you make that announcement real quick, Grandpa? Yeah. Well, yeah, we had a, a new grandbaby this morning about 9.30. We got a call. Yeah. We don't know its name for sure. They're kind of holding out on the name, but uh, he's a healthy boy, about 16. And so, uh, <laughs> five pounds, 15 ounces. So I always say almost 16. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations, Bill and Linda. And to you too, honey. That's right. You've got a new brother. That's great. All right. Well, uh, listen, a couple of other things just to hit real quick. Uh, one is next week is our 10th anniversary celebration of Homestead. And so we're going to have a big party and do that, a fiesta party. We'll run the doors up. We're going to try to set up a tent. And uh, we've got some... Uh, uh, carnitas that Howard Elmer is going to be putting together. We've got jalapeno poppers we're going to be throwing in with, with beans and rice and then cantaloupe and watermelon. It's a big party. So uh, there will be baptisms that day as well. So if you have trusted the Lord but you haven't been baptized yet, talk to Pastor Brock about that. And uh, then we'll be sharing a little bit about the history of God's faithfulness and how he brought uh, all of these things to pass. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years already. The other thing I want to underscore is a upcoming conference at Grace Bible Church where they're bringing in a husband and wife from Spokane. Now, Bonnie's brother is a theological uh, prof, and he gives these people the highest recommendations for marriage uh, principles, marriage counseling kind of principles, as well as child rearing. Uh, so, uh, Bonnie and I, at our age, we're going to go because we always can use a little bit of uh, encouragement that way in, in marriages. And so, uh, Mom and Dad, uh, please take advantage of this. There's sign-up sheets now at the, all the doors, and you can kind of sign up and let us know. Uh, they want to know because they provide lunch on Saturday for that. Child care is provided up to four years of age on Saturday, too. So, Mom and Dad, if you're trying to work out those kind of things. So... Take advantage of this great opportunity, great couple with lots of wisdom uh, to be able to share. So, uh, I think that's all that I'm supposed to. Am I forgetting something else? Seems like there might have been something else. But I, Mark Lamon, you can come on up. Mark's going to kind of do our call to worship and kind of lay the groundwork. And then uh, as he gets ready to pray, the worship team will come up. Can you put that slide on? So this morning I'm going to share some factoids about stones. And you may think to yourself, Mark, what are you doing? This is church. Uh, but it'll become apparent when Brock brings his name. So 
So when we were overseas, uh, we used stone fruits as a um, an access tool, a strategy tool to get into villages, ethnic villages where we otherwise would not have been allowed to go. So we learned a whole lot of facts, a whole bunch of stuff about stone fruit. We just geeked out on it on the internet and went to visit people and so we have this world of knowledge about stone fruits and one of the interesting things I want to talk about this morning has to do with the stone. Um, this is a peach pit stone that I, I ate this peach yesterday. <laughs> I got it from the Koza family. It's just absolute, have you ever had a homegrown peach that was just, I mean, it's like to die for. The peel just pulled off with your fingers. It was just wonderful. But this seed, if you'd never, actually, I didn't taste a homegrown peach till I was in my 20s because I grew up way down South Texas, and they don't grow in hot places like that, at least not without a good winter. And uh, anyway, if you look at this peach and you try to explain to somebody what a peach was and all you had to show them was a seed, it'd be very hard to describe a peach. So this morning is going to be about that, but I have a, a, a fact to share about they have to go through winter. God created uh, this seed to know what springtime, to know when springtime comes and to, to sprout and germinate at the proper time. And he put something really unique in this seed. If you planted this seed in the fall uh, when it hadn't gone through a winter and you watered it and the Temperature got warm enough, you think, well, this thing might sprout. No, it's not going to do it until it goes through the winter. And what it is, there's some chemicals in here. They have fancy uh, names, the scientists. They, one of them is called endogenic uh, inhibitors to germination. Well, endogenic just means inside the seed. They don't know what to call it, so <laughs> they have a fancy name. Anyway... This seed has to go through cold at least two and a half months below 50 degrees in a, car, in a cold, dark place like buried in the ground. Then the, the inhibitors that stop it from germinating leach away as something magical happens. They don't know why it takes cold to make it happen. But God created this thing to germinate in the spring and in it has to go through winter. And as Brock preaches this morning, when you think about winter and springtime, don't uh, get hung up on the drudgery of winter. I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically now about uh, passing on to the next slide. Don't feel bad about that. It's something that God designed, and springtime's coming. Amen. Amen. All right, worship team, come up, and uh, I'll pray to get us started. Father, we're so grateful that you're the creator, sustainer, that your plans have been uh, perfect since you conceived of them before you actually created. And you created four seasons for us to enjoy. And, Father, when the winter of our lives come, um, Please help us look forward to springtime. And help us now as we think about you and about what's to come, that we can just worship you with our whole hearts, focused on you, not thinking about anything else, but just enjoying the salvation and the fellowship in this church that you've given us. In Jesus, we ask this blessing. Amen. morning. We're going to uh, have you stand for us uh, with us for the first song. We don't have it on the, on the deal yet, but it'll be there. If we don't, we can lip sing and we can have each other. Oh, it, there it it's is. There. <laughs> so when we all get to heaven, that's what's coming after the spring. Love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace in the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a 
Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory. Will the chores of life prepare when we all get to hell? What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us. the streets of gold when we all get to hell what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory you be seated please and it's something how quick things change. I think I had a, my air conditioner on three or four days ago, and today we turned the heat on. So that's, I've lived in this valley for 70 years, and, and uh, I've never seen a normal year yet. <laughs> but it's coming. It's coming. Our next song is going to be When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. And I was thinking when we were in school back in the old days they took roll call almost every morning and your name was written in the book and somebody made a check or if you were there if you answered the roll so it made me think in this week about this song and the believer's name is written in the book and there will be a roll at the time and you need to have a check and have your name there and the roll. And those names are there. It's, it's done. So we need to be thinking about eternal. And is the roll called, when the roll is called up yonder, where will we be? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen one shall gather to their homes beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll when the world is called up yonder, I'll be there. the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. And when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. 
When the roll is called the yonder, when the roll is called the yonder, when the roll is called the day, all right. Uh, you'll want to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember the old uh, choose your own adventure novels from when you were a kid? Do they still have those for kids? Do kids read those anymore? When I was in school, there were a bunch of those things. And so the basic idea is stories going on. You're reading this story, and you come to this point in the story, and there's a stop. you got to make a choice, you know, A or B. And based on which one you choose, then you flip to whatever page in the book where that part of the story. Basically, there's like a fork in the road. And so... Uh, if you choose A, well, then these other possibilities open up uh, and these other things happen in the story. But naturally, B, if you, that means whatever would have happened if you had chosen B is cut off. That's no longer possible and vice, vice versa. So I can't remember one in particular, but, you know, it'd be like I tried to make something up here. Like, okay, you're in Seattle and there's a ferry leaving to cross Puget Sound, and at the same time, there's a plane that's flying out to British Columbia, and they're leaving at the same time. So do you get on the ferry, or do you get on the plane? 
And maybe if you get on the ferry, you bump into this person and you meet the love of your life, the person you're going to marry. But if you get on the plane, it doesn't happen or something like that. So a fork in the road, the proverbial fork in the road. This sermon is not a choose-your-own-adventure novel, but it does have one similarity. Uh, We could see, kind of the way my mind saw it this week, this argument, the way Paul lays this out in 1 Corinthians, like this fork in the road, and if one path is, there's two possibilities. And so it centers on this question, did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? I mean, is that an actual thing that happened? Is that historical reality? Or is that just something people kind of made up because it makes us feel better? And so, based on whether or not that's actually true, if it's no, then a number of things logically fall into place on a path. um, And another sequence of events won't happen. If the answer is yes, then then certain things await uh, on the horizon of history. So, here's what I mean. If the answer is no... Then verses 14 to 19, and this is a bit of a review from last week, verses 14 to 19 say this. If Christ has not been raised, verse 14, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we've testified about God that he raised Jesus, raised Christ, whom he did not raise if the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So we said last week that one way to think about that set of verses is that people have said, you know, the resurrection is like the keystone to Christianity. That, you know, when the Romans built these stone arches, there was a keystone, the stone, the final stone that was laid in the middle that tied the whole arch together and gave it its integrity and strength. And if you remove the keystone, obviously the whole structure collapses. And that's what Paul says. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, if there is no resurrection then this preaching right now, what's happening here, is meaningless, it's worthless, it's empty, you shouldn't even be here, you shouldn't listen to it, I shouldn't be standing here, your faith is in vain, you know, all these things that we've talked about, faith in Christ, it's empty and useless, you're dead in your sins, there's no forgiveness of sins, and it's hopeless. And so the people who have died, fallen asleep, verse 18 says, in Christ, having faith in Jesus, Well, they've just perished. Like they're gone. You'll never see them again. It's over. So if there's no resurrection, then death, that means death reigns supreme as the sovereign power over the universe. Right? It holds all the cards, death. We can run, but we ultimately can't hide. There's this guillotine hanging over our heads, just waiting to fall arbitrarily, and then it's done and over. Hebrews 2 talks about people who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Uh, I got a call two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three, from Carol Bullard up at the hospital. She's a nurse. And she called me. She said, we don't have chaplains since COVID happened. There's no like chaplains around much at the hospital anymore. I've got this family that I've been caring for on the second floor here. And the, they're in comfort measures, which means there's nothing we can do. This person's about to die. We're trying to just keep them out of pain on their way out. And they've requested that maybe a Christian minister could come pray with them, pray with the family. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll be up there. So I come up, I go up to the hospital, walk in the room, and I've never met any of these people before in my life. I don't know any of them. And there's like six people in there, family members, you know, tears. And then in the bed, they say, come on in. 
there's this frail lady, looks like maybe she's in her 70s, uh, and in the bed, very weak, you know, needs help breathing, super thin, frail. I mean, she's right there. I mean, she's within hours, minutes, who knows, and she's going to die. And so what do you say to people like that? Okay, there's comfort measures for the body. Are there any comfort measures for the soul, for the heart, for these people in tears? Uh, What do you offer? If there's no resurrection, there's no life after death for those who have trusted Jesus, well, there's no hope. What could I say? Say something nice that, you know, just to be nice, but it's not actually true. What I did was I took them, I mean, I just felt like the Lord led me here. I took them to verses 20, 21, 22, 23, that represent this other fork in the trail. And I read that to them to try and... Point them to the gospel, not knowing where they were necessarily spiritually for sure. Um, And so Paul says here, okay, if the answer is no, these things logically follow. If the answer is yes, then there's a bunch of other things that are true that are going to come to pass in history. So he says the answer is yes. Verse 20, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. That is a fact of history. It happened in real time and space nearly 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. He rose from the dead. He appeared, the Bible tells us, over a period of 40 days following his resurrection. And these verses back in the start of this chapter, verse 6, 5, 6, 7, and 8, tell us who some of these eyewitnesses were, and there are over 500 that he appeared to, and so over, it wasn't like a one-time deal where a few people hallucinated this one time. Forty days, all kinds of different sightings across forty days. A couple guys on a road here, twelve disciples in a room there, uh, some disciples on the beach in a boat, five hundred people at once, Paul on the Damascus Road, the guy writing this, who hated Christianity and was going to persecute them, And so there's all of these eyewitnesses to this attesting this is a historical fact. This is not a made-up story, and they're willing to suffer and bleed and die for that testimony. Because they knew it to be true. So Paul says the answer, did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead, is yes. In fact, he did. And because he did, that means then that several things will follow They are guaranteed to happen to come to pass. And so I want to point out three things from these verses here. Number one, this guarantees that Jesus will come again. The fact that he rose from the dead. So verse 23 speaks of his coming. If you glance there. A dead Jewish carpenter who's still dead is no good to anybody. We've just said that, right? He said he would rise from the dead. It came to pass. He says he's coming again. It will come to pass. He will return. So here are, uh, so there's that. Then there's this, which is tied to it. Number two, his people will be raised when he comes. That's the second thing that will logically flow from that. That is guaranteed to happen because Christ has been raised from the dead. So, Verses 20 to 23, read like this in case you don't have a Bible in front of you. But here's that chunk. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. And then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So all humanity is under the headship of one of two men. He says, there's this divide in Adam or in Christ. We all come into the world in Adam, in solidarity with Adam. Fallen by nature and we follow him in our choice. Who here hasn't sinned? 
Who here has lived perfectly in obedience to God your whole life? We come in in Adam. Everybody starts there. And as a result, the consequence is death exists because of sin. But we can come out from under that headship in solidarity with Adam who disobeyed God in the garden and come under the headship of the second man, Jesus Christ, who obeyed God perfectly. Come under His reign, subjection to Him through faith in Him. And for those who do that, they will be made alive as He was raised from the dead, as He lives. Uh, he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Anybody here like to garden? Nathan Gardner, who has like a one acre garden or something, producing enough food for all of us? Who likes to garden? Who here is raising livestock? Do you look forward to calving and lambing time? Yes and no, maybe. <laughs> That's a double-edged sword. But there is the joy. Hey, there's the first lamb, the first calf. There's more to come, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. That first, okay, July, I love raspberries in the garden. That first red, sun-ripened raspberry, and like, they're almost, there's one right there that's ready. The harvest is coming. The tomatoes in August, the ears of corn in August. Christ is the first fruits. His resurrection as the first is a guarantee of a harvest to follow. Those who believe and trust in Him, who are aligned with Him, united to Him in solidarity with Jesus, joined to Him, who belong to Him, will be raised with Him. An amazing harvest is yet to come. And so the death of the Christian is temporary, referred to as sleep. The body sleeps. You know, people used to say, maybe they still say this, Rest in peace. Now, sleep's a temporary state. Okay, the body's in the ground, but it's there temporarily. Re it's resting until Jesus comes. So there's a... I used to like to walk around cemeteries. I still do. Uh, they're peaceful places, and it helps put some things in perspective in life. There is a tombstone on a cemetery in this valley. I think it might be Hillcrest, right up over here off of Foothill Road. I don't remember the person's name, but inscribed on the tombstone, it says something like this. This is pretty close. Asleep till Jesus comes. So it's got their name, dates, birth, death, asleep until Jesus comes. And there's a scripture verse there. Might be this one, might be 1 Thessalonians or something. Um, so there's those two things. And then Paul goes on to say there's a third thing. Because the answer to the question, did Jesus really rise from the dead, is yes. It also means that this will happen. That all enemies of God will be subdued. That's kind of an interesting turn. Don't you think? Maybe a little unexpected. So here's the verses. Verse 24, 25, 26, 27. So, those who are with Christ will be raised at His coming. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For He must reign until He has put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet, under the feet of Jesus. Does the direction of this world and the way certain things are going bother you? Are you fed up with people being in rebellion against God and His ways? Do you find yourself sickened by some of the evil in this world? Do you find yourself praying something like this more often in so many words, Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on the earth as in heaven. Clearly there are many people in our world who are not living in subjection and submission to the revealed will of God. Does your heart cry out for justice in the earth? For righteousness to reign? Uh, 
The other night we watched a documentary, Heidi and I, my wife and I, on some of the transgenderism stuff. And just, just, I mean, just some heartbreaking things. It's pretty graphic, some of the, you know, pictures they showed. Um, But one of the things, you come away with just the sadness for some of the young kids who've been sucked into that and deceived by that, into that kind of way of thinking. But um, they also kind of highlighted some of these folks, kind of the proselytizers, some of these adults who really are grooming kids at a young age in a certain direction and really preying on young people, deceiving young people and sucking them in, brainwashing them into just some stuff that is, it is out and route out evil. It is insidious evil. And some of these people, I mean, they showed some clips even. The, I mean, just... In God's face, I, I basically hate God, I'm God. You know, that's behind, that's at work in their heart, driving some of this stuff. And so, I mean, you just kind of came away shell-shocked. And your heart kind of, oh, God. I mean, I want righteousness to reign in this earth. Uh, remember the parable of the persistent widow? Remember this parable? Jesus tells, there's a judge. He's an unrighteous judge. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't fear men. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. He's about himself. He's got authority and power. He's a judge. But he doesn't really care about justice. There's a widow. And something's been done that's wrong. And so she's coming to the judge, the only authority she can. And she's asking for justice. And the judge is like, get out of my hair, old lady. Like, leave me alone. I don't care. But she wears him down with her coming, right? She keeps coming and coming and coming. And finally, to get her out of his hair, he says, all right, fine. I'll give you what you want. Leave me alone. And Jesus, do you remember how he ends that? What the point of that was? He ends it like this. He says this. This is in Luke 18. Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, to his chosen people who cry to him day and night? So our hearts crying for justice. Will he delay long over them? Will God delay long? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? So when does ultimate justice in the universe come? How does it arrive? How does it come? Jesus tells a parable about God granting justice and he caps it with what? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? In other words, the justice comes, the righteousness we long for comes when Jesus comes. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as in heaven. The kingdom comes in its fullness when the king comes. So really, ultimately, that prayer finds its answer in the return of the king, the coming of Jesus. So when he comes again, he will put his foot on the neck of his enemies. He must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And that includes the enemy of death. That is the consequence of sin. This trifecta here of terms in verse 24. He's going to abolish every rule and every authority and every power. Those three terms. Paul often uses those to refer to demonic powers set over against God's spiritual power. So you remember the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but our fighting is against the rulers and the powers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Speaking of demonic forces, demons in opposition against God who influence people. And so that's included when he comes to squash that rebellion But it certainly would include those 
human authorities and rulers and powers as well. Uh, Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. I mean, what is that? That's rebellion, right? God, we don't want you or your son to rule over us. No. This, by the way, is, I've told you this, how... I used to think when I was not a believer in Jesus. This idea of a Lord? A Lord? What are we, living in the 1600s? A Lord? Who's going to be my boss? Who's the king that I would have to answer to? I hated that idea. No way. A Lord? No way. I don't need a Lord. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm my own Lord. What's God's response? Psalm goes on and says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He'll speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. My kingdom will prevail. Goes on and says this, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, and now you hear the voice of the Son, the Anointed One, the Messiah. You are my Son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Whoa. And then the psalm ends with this call to respond in light of his sovereign power. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who do what? Take refuge in Him. So, have you taken your refuge in Jesus from the wrath to Him? Have you kissed the Son? You know, bowed to kiss the signet ring of the King in homage to the King. In the first coming, Jesus came as The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he comes, takes on flesh, first coming, mercy mission. Love of God to offer himself a sacrifice for sin. On the cross, he who knew no sin is made to be sin on our behalf. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paying the debt we owe, dying the death we deserve, the wrath of God satisfied in his sacrifice as proven by his resurrection from the dead. And so there's this offer that the king makes, this invitation. You can make a trade. How's this for a trade? You take your sin and its consequence, eternal death and hopelessness, and you look to him in faith, That sin is placed on His Son, accounted to Him, the sinless one. In return, you just bow the knee to Jesus. In in return, I give you my righteousness. Credit to your account is perfection. The record of Jesus by faith. The swap happens, and now you have eternal life with me. Your sins are forgiven. And you can look forward to resurrection forever and ever. How's that for a trade? All you got to do is not be your own God anymore. The invite to his kingdom is still on the table. It's on the table right here today. Right here as we speak. It still stands. Have you entered into the kingdom? 
saying, I'm not going my own way anymore. Jesus, you're the king. I want to seat at your table in your kingdom. God's left this invitation on the table for a long time now, right? A long time. Like 2,000 years long time. Remember, I was reading 2 Peter. Remember what 2 Peter says? There's people that scoff at the prospect of the return of Jesus. Where is the promise of his coming? Everything's gone on as it's always gone on on this earth. What are you talking about? For thousands of years, nothing's really changed that much. Life goes on. Jesus coming again, they scoff at that. It's been forever. It's not really going to happen. If it was going to happen, it would have happened a long time ago. You're still waiting for that 2,000 years later? It's ridiculous. What's Peter's answer to that? Remember? The Lord is patient. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Not willing, doesn't delight in pouring out wrath. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, he comes the first time as the Lamb of God. There's a time coming when the gates will shut. The kingdom gates will shut. The invitation will no longer be on the table. And the time for judgment will come. The second time Jesus comes, he comes as what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. There's not going to be another lamb coming. There's not going to be another sacrifice. That happened once for all time. That's been done. Second time... It's the lion. When he comes, Revelation says he comes in a robe dipped in blood. It says when he comes, he comes riding a white horse. And who comes with him? Armies. The armies of heaven. It says he comes to tread the winepress of of the wrath of God the Almighty. He, it says in righteousness. He judges and makes war. It says he will rule the nations. With a rod of iron. Second Thessalonians says he will come in flaming fire. Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. All of that is a consequence of his resurrection. All of that will pass because he is raised from the dead and he is the sovereign Lord. Have you bowed to him as king? Truly. If you have, there's no more wrath for you. You've made the exchange by faith. His righteousness has been given to you. Your sins are forgiven. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's the first fruits. You're joined to Him. You're under His headship. You belong to Him. You share His fate for all eternity, resurrection, eternal life with God. In the heavens and earth, new heavens and new earth, where righteousness reigns. Where there's perfect justice. Everything in subjection to God. There's a, another tombstone, speaking of tombstones, on a hillside outside of Enterprise. There's a man we love buried in that tomb, in that grave, with that tombstone. A young man who loves Jesus, who we love, who died young. On his tombstone are written these words. From Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock. And my salvation. My fortress. My refuge. I shall not be shaken. Because of faith in Christ. The verses. In 1 Corinthians, finished like this in verse 27 and 28. 
God has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that He, God, is accepted, who put all things in subjection under Him, Jesus. When all things are subjected to Him, Jesus, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him, God, who put all things in subjection under Him, Jesus, that God may be all in all. Do you get all that? Jesus never sinned, so he's always been in subjection to his Father. And will be for all eternity. All things will be under his feet, and he'll be under the headship of God. Though he is fully God and equal with God the Father. His kingdom will come. And his will will be done in heaven as on earth. So because Jesus rose from the dead, these three things will happen. Aren't you glad you're not in your own choose-your-own-adventure novel? Like, maybe no's true. I'm going to take the no road. With all that falls out, it's all meaningless. Aren't you glad that God chose the end? Planned the begin, in, beginning to the end? It is true that Jesus really rose from the dead. That means these three things will take place. This is where history is headed. This is what's to come. He will come again. When he comes, his people will come with him, be raised. And when he comes, all enemies will be subdued and there will be righteousness in the earth. Hallelujah. So, the only way I could think to end this, best way I could think of by way of a response for us, uh, is to have a moment of silence. And what's on my heart, and I don't know what's on yours, but what's on mine is this. To pray for people whose names maybe have come to your mind as you've been listening to this, to pray for people who have not yet repented and turned to Jesus in faith, to pray for their salvation, that they might have this resurrection with him to look forward to. You know, when after the winter, the peach pit germinates and there's life. So does that sound okay? Will you do that while... Observe a moment of silence, pray for who's on your heart, and then I'll close this, all right? Lord Jesus, we, we are grateful, though there's a certain heaviness tied to these truths, we are nonetheless very grateful um, that you reign and that there is ultimate justice for the universe, on the universe, and in the earth. And so um, we thank you for that, God. You are to be praised for that. Because there is a lot of evil that happens that people seem to get away with uh, in this life or in the short run. But in the end, there is a recompense for all. And we thank you, God, that you have sent your son and that Jesus, that you came to deliver us from your righteous wrath and justice and to bring us into your kingdom You've paid for our sins, that there is eternal life in you. There is forgiveness and the mercy and grace of God. We give you praise, and I just want to offer this prayer for those that we know who we have prayed that have been on our hearts just now, who have yet 
who believe to turn to you in faith and humble themselves before you as their Savior King, I pray that you would work in their hearts and that that would happen, Lord, that they would come to faith and be saved. We thank you, God, for your long-suffering. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is That is your desire, and we pray for that, Lord. And we give you thanks this day in Jesus' name. Amen.